Um, so thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to be taking uh, somewhat of a different angle. I'm going to be talking more about um, how we actually study, how do we measure, and how do we study um, equity or inequities. Um, and I'm obviously specifically interested in cancer, so I'm going to be focusing on uh, research related to cancer. So I'm gonna take a word about defining and measuring equity and gender. Um, and then I'm going to draw on the work of three of my colleagues who have um, studied this in detail with respect to equity in colorectal cancer care, equity of care for several cancers, including diagnosis of uh, oral cancer, and equity and power, uh, and I'll explain to you what that means momentarily, and then uh, the conclusions. So first of all, a word about defining and measuring equity. In order to be able to study equity, we really do need to take a population-based perspective. Uh, we can't do this kind of research exclusively from the hospital setting because we don't know what the broader population is that perhaps isn't making it into the hospital. So we're vulnerable to important biases. So we do have to do population-based studies. We know uh, that cancer survival in the U.S. is linked to socio socioeconomic status, age, and rage. But is it the case that in Canada, with universal access to health care, that we suffer the same problems? So just a word about definitions. When we talk about socioeconomic status uh, in population-based research, we're really using what we call an ecological variable, which is that we're looking at the economic, the median income of the individual's neighborhood because we don't have information about the precise income of that family. So there's a, a certain level of generalizability and perhaps a, um, a certain bias that's introduced, but it's important to realize that. The other point about equity is that um, there's, there is a distinction between equity and equality. So equity is equal access for equal need, but it also means greater access for greater need. Um, inequality is when there's variation in access, but inequity is when there's variation in access that's ethically problematic. So I just want to, we talk about equity, uh, but sometimes really what we're talking about is equality, unless we have a way of understanding what the difference in needs actually is. Similarly for gender versus sex, we all, often talk about a gender-based analysis, but really um, one is the difference between, it's the difference between what's biologically determined and what's socially constructed identity. And again, when we're using these population-based databases, we, we say gender, but really we only know about the individual sex and we don't know uh, truly about their socially constructed identity. So that, that's just a word and now of course I'm going to go on and talk about equity and gender. Um, in order to uh, study equity, what we really need to do um, is to deconstruct the population that we're interested in um, into, I saw you had a pointer, um, into, into various subgroups that might represent uh, a problem of equity. So it's taking the overall population and dividing it into um, uh, different subgroups and studying how those subgroups do. Um, uh, within each other. So here's a really nice example from the power study, which if we just look at the overall population and we look at single parent family income, we think, well, you know, not too bad. But if you deconstruct that, if you de-aggregate it and look at single parent family income when the, the head of the family is male versus the head of the family is female, you see that you have an important problem. So it's by, own, by looking at those subgroups analysis that we understand those kinds of issues. So now I'm going to talk about the work of some colleagues of mine, uh, Andre Madison and Yukiko Osada in Nova Scotia, who looked at equity in colorectal cancer care. And this was part of a team grant that I held when I was in Nova Scotia. And this was our conceptual framework, where we were interested in the entire continuum of care from screening to end of life care. And we defined um, the fact that an individual has a need. When an individual has a need, do they have access to care? And if they have access to care, do they then have access to quality care? 
And we were, the, the program of research was to look at whether along the continuum of care there was inequity along the continuum or whether there was inequity in terms of the access to quality cancer care. And I'm just going to give you a little flavor of um, the work that um, uh, Andre Madison did. First, the first thing he did was he did a systematic review of um, inequity in, in Canada. Um, and that I it was reported in Cancer Causes and Control in 2001. And he found that there were 51 studies in Canada that did look at the issue of inequity in cancer care. And a couple of the findings, for example, was uh, that d there were differences in wait times for diagnosis if you were based in a rural versus an urban setting. Uh, there was differences in the receipt of appropriate radiotherapy if you were younger versus whether you were older. And there were differences in access to palliative care depending on how far you lived from the palliative care program, your age, and your sex. The specific study that he did, the objectives were to determine uh, in inequity in access to colorectal cancer care by adjusting for clinical practice guidelines and patients' needs for care, and to calculate the extent to which there were income, age, sex, and dis distance-related inequities. The population was everybody diagnosed with colorectal cancer in the province of Nova Scotia over a five-year period um, who underwent surgical resection for their tumor. And there were a, th a total of 1,000 people in that study. And what he found was that there was an indication of a, a pro-young, a pro-male, um, inequity to receipt of radiotherapy. So uh, younger individuals and males were more likely to receive radio appropriate radiotherapy. There were indications of pro-young, pro-female, pro-close pro distance uh, to the cancer center with respect to primary care physician access. And individuals from the urban areas were more likely to have more than one emergency department visit in the last 30 days of life and were more likely to die outside of hospital. So those were some of the variations in the stratification factors that he found in Nova Scotia. Um, another colleague of mine, Patty Groom, who works in uh, the Division of Cancer Care Epidemiology at Queen's University, has done a lot of work in this area. Um, and she looked at equity in care for several cancers um, and specifically for diagnosis of oral cancer. So in the first study, she was interested in determining whether certain demographic and geographic variables were associated with quick deaths among cancer patients. Um, the rationale for this is that some persons with cancer die more quickly after a diagnosis than others. It implies that the diagnosis occurred later in the disease course and possibly long after the cancer was actually clinically apparent. And it likely reflects an extreme problem with access to proper health care. She did a case control study looking at individuals with breath, colorectal, head and neck, lung, prostate cancer, and cancers of unknown origin. And, and there were a total of 5,000 uh, individuals with cancer in the case who, were, uh, who had a quick death. And this was operationalized as either they were the lowest 10 percentile, 10% uh, of, of dying quickly, or they died within 30 days of diagnosis. So that was the group that she defined as having a quick death and then compared them to individuals who uh, died uh, over a year past diagnosis in a case control study design. And she found that lower socioeconomic status and increasing age were most strongly and consistently associated with an early death. Male gender was a risk factor for early death for lung cancer. Living in urban areas was a risk factor for early death for breast, lung, and unknown primaries. And increasing age was associated with a higher risk of catastrophic death for most diseases. So once again, we see some degree of uh, a relationship between inequity and age, inequity in socioeconomic status, and inequity based on gender. In the second study, she was uh, interested in investigating the association with oral cavity cancer. Um, and disease stage and factors that may compromise access to timely diagnosis. So the background here is oral cavities uh, cancers are actually very rare cancers. Um, they represent less than 1% of cancers in Canada and about uh, 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 1,150 deaths. 
75% uh, are attributable to tobacco use, um, and the incidence is higher in individuals who are heavy smokers. Cure rates are highest and disfigurement least likely when those cancers are treated early. So this is a cancer where it's really important to make an early diagnosis. Um, nevertheless, the majority are detected with advanced disease and survival in North America is quite poor. And patient delay has been shown to be a primary reason for late stage diagnosis. So in this pop, uh, study, it was again all individuals in Ontario who were diagnosed with um, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the floor of the mouth, or the anterior uh, two-thirds of the tongue, with a total of 2,000 patients involved. And there was a retrospective uh, um, cohort study using administrative data, province-wide, population-based, but it was enriched by going to chart review in order to get a deeper sense of some of the um, uh, factors that we aren't able to determine from administrative health databases. So social characteristics of the patient, such as whether they were married, uh, whether they were socially marginalized living in uh, temporary ho housing um, or in shelters, uh, perhaps some of Jeff's patients were involved in this study, um, and the lifestyle factors, whether they're smokers or heavy drinkers. Um, and she was interested in health system accents, the patient factors related to delay, the physician factors delay, delay, and system factors uh, related to the delay. And the interesting thing that she found was that, in fact, um, the majority of diagnosis of these cancers happened through the family physician's office because people were presenting when they were already symptomatic. Um, so it wasn't happening because they were being properly screened. Um, and it wasn't happened because the lesion was detected, it was because the patient was already symptomatic, which really is an indicator for more advanced disease. And pointing to this specifically, those who presented with late stage disease were more likely to be the ones that had a lesion which they had ignored. So there was some factor that was in, in, that was in a barrier to their accessing health care despite having a lesion um, that they were aware of. And some of the um, factors associated with higher stage diagnosis were being socially marginalized, um, older age, and it was protective to see a regular dentist, which we can pretty well say is associated with socioeconomic status, and of course, having a precancerous lesion detected rather than a full-blown cancerous lesions. So the conclusions uh, are that family doctors actually are a key referral route for these cancers. Um, socially marginalized groups are at higher risk of advanced disease. Uh, late detection of oral cavity cancer can be viewed as an example of poor health care access. Uh, Jeff, I wonder if you do a screening test of lesions in the mouth. You do? Great. Uh, and understanding the factors associated with late detection provides a way of identifying populations who need outreach and education. Now, the POWER study is a major study that has been taking place in Ontario. It's uh, a brilliant acronym for Project for an Ontario Women's Health Evidence-Based Report. Uh, the principal investigator is Arlene Bierman, and the cancer chapter was written by Monica Kuzanowska. Um, and this is the range of different studies, uh, uh, diseases that they looked at, and I'm going to uh, focus on the cancer chapter today, and here are the authors of the cancer chapter. So the main study question was, are there differences in quality of cancer care with respect to sex, age, income, or, other, um, or where one lives? They used an approach, a quality indicator approach, which is um, a way of defining certain metrics that have been proven to be associated with good outcomes. And these are quality indicators. They've been shown either through randomized control trials or a range of other things that this, this measure is associated with a good outcome. And after reviewing all possible indicators in the literature, they settled on 29 indicators um, for their cancer chapter. Um, and here is the breakdown of the different numbers of indicators within each type of cancer. So the first thing that was interesting was they found that there were some sex differences existed, but they were not pronounced. Um, and here is a, just an example for fecal occult blood testing, um, that there were not big differences in terms of um, the, 
the uh, male or female. Um, we will talk a little bit more about the, ge the differences according to socioeconomic status. But in terms of gender, they did not find for all of the different quality indicators that they looked at that there were di big differences in terms of males and females. Uh, similarly, for the percent percentage of patients with rectal cancer that received sphincter sparings procedure, this is a, 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 the recommended type of procedure for rectal cancer, and again, they did not find major differences in terms of gender. However, they did find that income matters when it comes to cancer incidence, cancer survival, and screening, but it is generally not an important factor in cancer treatment. So this, I think, speaks to the determinants of health on the one hand, um, and the fact that the healthcare system is responsive on the other hand once an individual comes into the healthcare system. So here are the age standard incidents for lung cancer uh, by sex and neighborhood income, and you can see that there is a clear uh, gradient in, in terms of the incidence of lung cancer uh, from the lowest income uh, to the highest income qu uh, quintiles. Uh, similarly, uh, in terms of um, having regular mammograms, again, we see that there is a gradient with the, those in the lowest income having fewer mammograms than those in the highest income brackets. Um, and again, we see the same thing for pap testing, that uh, screening for cervical cancer, um, there is a, a, a gradient uh, for in, uh, based on income. But then if you take pa uh, cervical cancer screening and disaggregate it even more, there's some more interesting things that one can discern. For example, if you look at Canadian-born um, and long-term residents, they would have higher rates of cerc for cervical cancer screening than immigrants would. Um, older women were less likely to have at least one pap test uh, during the period than younger women win, were. And within certain immigration groups, women from South Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa were the least likely to have cervical cancer screening. And women in the lowest income neighborhood had the lower rates, which is a graph that we already saw. So further disaggregation of the data gives us more insights uh, into other groups um, that might be vulnerable. Age is an extremely important determinant of treatment. Marked difference um, according to age group as to whether or not women received breast cancer surgery with axillary nodal dissection. Again, this is the standard of care um, for that uh, form of, of cancer. Similarly, for ovarian cancer, uh, whether they received post-operative chemotherapy, um, there was a marked decrease in terms of um, uh, elderly patients. Where you live in Ontario also affects many aspects of the cancer care, of the cancer care that you receive. And they use this very um, useful uh, way of illustrating the different treatment approaches or, or different access to treatment depending on where in the province that you are. This reflects the overall uh, rate for the province. Um, and then you can see that there are some substantial differences, for example, in northern Ontario um, versus um, you know, eastern, eastern Ontario. And again, this is an eight standard percentage of screen eligible adults who received one or more fecal occult blood test. This is a recommended maneuver for, for screening for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, and there is a very interesting graphic way of present, uh, presenting uh, differences in geographical variation. And this is the final slide with respect to differences in geographical variation, where you can see that the rate of uh, the percentage of women who underwent primary ovarian cancer surgery by a gynecologist had marked difference depending on where they are. Um, this, this, this group here is the Champlain region with DAA Ottawa, um, and uh, this group here is um, from uh, yeah, the Erie St. Clair region. So there is a variation, and we see this in so many different aspects of healthcare where there's a marked variation in outcomes um, and in the kinds of procedures that are done depending on the, um, the geographic location of the individual. What they did in this report is they produced a report card, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, but I think it gives you an opportunity to eyeball 
um, how the, the um, differences were with respect to all the quality indicators that they looked at. So these were the various stratification factors, um, and the Ys indicate when they found that there was a variation for that stratification uh, factor um, for each of the indicators that they studied. And so I would recommend, um, if you'd like to uh, see this in more detail, that you go to the Power Study website uh, where you'll be able to um, uh, find these, these uh, reports. So in conclusion, I think we should be a little bit more careful about how we talk about equity and equality and be sure that we really are meaning equity because sometimes when there is equality, it's inequitable because people who have lesser need might be getting the same care as those who, who have greater need. Um, there is a consistency across studies um, if of inequity with respect to age, socioeconomic status, and place of residence. It's important to routinely look at differences in care between subgroups of individuals. Uh, sex differences in, in, exist in cancer incidence and cancer survival, but it's less pronounced when it comes to processes of care and it's less pronounced when it comes to actual treatment. So that's the, the glass is half full part of this, of this uh, presentation, that when people get into the system, uh, care tends to be more um, equal um, or equitable, uh, but it's the process of getting into the system or some of the lifestyle factors, such as screening behavior, that might be the impediment to good outcomes for, these, uh, for our populations. I'd like to acknowledge again uh, my colleagues whose uh, work I've drawn on for this presentation, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. There, yeah, um, no, there, oh, sorry. The question is, um, should people over 80 get that kind of treatment, essentially? And yeah, um, the, um, the, the study, these studies are adjusted for comorbidities, which would be a significant factor for determining whether or not somebody should or shouldn't get a treatment. So they are adjusted for comorbidity. Um, Whenever you're looking at population, first of all, in terms of recommended care, um, the, all of the, out, out, all of the um, measures that they were using were consistent with recommended care for that age group. So for example, colorectal cancer chemotherapy, um, there it is recommended that people who are elderly tolerate chemotherapy well and should be provided with chemotherapy. Um, what we don't know, um, from this kind of study, which is, which is the cautionary note, is we don't know about patient preference. So it, it is likely to be, it may well be, that a proportion of parent patients do not get the treatment because of their preference. And that's where, um, as I say, one needs to be mindful. But what one can do um, is, is look at different jurisdictions and see if there are big variations across jurisdictions. And if you can hypothesize that likely patient preferences are going to be similar across those jurisdictions and nevertheless see a big difference in treatment, then you could think that that might be related to inequity. How can the various lands use this information? And do they show interest in it? Well, uh, Cancer Care Ontario Oh, sorry, yes. Um, how do the various LINs um, use this information, and are they indeed interested in the information? Um, so this, this work that I showed w was not under the auspices of Cancer Care Ontario, but I'm going to draw on the example of Cancer Care Ontario because as the cancer agency for the province, it is uh, responsible for quality of cancer care, and they do a lot of their work um, at the LIN level and they present a lot of their data to leaders um, from each of the different LINs so that they know uh, what is happening specifically in their LIN. 
Okay. Alin uh, uh, is um, a, uh, uh, the, the province of Ontario has div been divided into, it, it, it is a region um, that um, is responsible for health care within that regional division. So I could show the map again. Um, and so that shows uh, the, the different LINs in the province of Ontario. Um, and um, they're, they're, they are responsible for health care within that region. They're a relatively new uh, structure. I mean, I remember the days when we had districts. Um, they're a relatively new structure. Um, they're, they're a structure that is, uh, you know, some believe are going to even have more influence uh, than they have in the past. But it's a way of looking at a geographical region responsible for health care. So are they interested? Based on the experience of Cancer Care Ontario, um, I, I would say that they're very interested uh, because there are leads within each of the LINs um, related to, um, uh, to screening, to primary care and cancer, to medical oncology, radiation oncology, and they're very interested in knowing how they perform relative to the other LINs.